Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Wine Investigators. Today, we are going to be talking kosher wine. We're 10 days away from Passover, so no doubt uh, those of you who celebrate are starting to turn your thoughts to what wines you want to fill your four cups with. So I'm going to offer some fun suggestions from some surprising wine regions. But uh, first, a little background on kosher wine in this country. Uh, I was talking about this with my aunt, and even in the 80s, you really couldn't get kosher wine of quality. Not to say Manischewitz is bad quality, but it's very, very sweet, as everyone knows. So if you wanted a dry wine style, it really wasn't available. The first uh, Italian wines that uh, the Royal Wine Corporation started importing was around 78. And that would have been a Valpolicella and a Suave, but they didn't really make a huge dent in the kosher wine market, especially for Passover, until the introduction of the now ubiquitous Bartonura Moscato. But it's kind of a kind of a fun story. Their decision in 1992 to move to the blue bottles, you know, was expensive, was not particularly in line with the region's rules around bottling but it was a genius idea. You think about uh, Tainant water around the same time, the late eighties and early nineties, people love blue bottles and people did love the blue bottle. I was reading a fun essay uh, by an author recalling, you know, the first time that they had something that wasn't sickeningly sweet at the Passover table. And that was the Bartonura Moscato. I'm not a Moscato lover, but you have to appreciate at 5% alcohol, you know, this way grandma and grandpa aren't getting polluted, but everyone can have their four glasses and it's light and it's refreshing and it's a little sweet. One interesting thing that happened with Bartonura starting around uh, 2000 was uh, its sudden prominence as a wine that folks enjoyed in the hip hop community. Lil Kim made her first reference to it in, I wanna say 2005, and then Drake in 2009. And in fact, you know, observant Jews are the smallest percentage of its customer base right now. And I think, you know, a lot of folks don't even know it's kosher, but the ones who do take that as a seal of quality, much like a kosher hot dog. So getting back to uh, the Royal Wine Corporation, uh, as I said, they first started importing dry wines in the late 70s, but you know, throughout the 80s, it wasn't really available. And you, in the early 90s, that's your, your Bartonura Renaissance started, and you, even though you know, Bordeaux properties, certainly Israel have been producing wine all this time. But if you were uh, you know, going to Seder's in the 80s and the 90s, you know, maybe you, know, you had access uh, to uh, you know, something like Baron Herzog, from California or uh, Carmel wines from Israel. Interesting note about Carmel, uh, in 1822, none other than Edmund de Rothschild, uh, owner of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, you know, one of the finest wines in the world, Bordeaux first growth, went to Israel to start consulting and then created a winery. And in fact, three Israeli prime ministers worked there at different times which is kind of fun, but we're gonna be focusing on some uh, Italian and French selections and also a South African selection today. If you want a refresher or a beginner's breakdown of all of the sort of rabbinical laws around kosher wine production, um, David Raka, who does Kosher Wine Musings, his blog did a really fun article uh, on that and I encourage you to, uh, to seek it out. Uh, he's both uh, very on the ball and also quite funny. So that's always a bonus. Um, getting back to, to Royal Wine Corporation, of course, who brought us Bartonura. They are you know, one of the biggest uh, importers of kosher wine, major force in the market. Uh, they have uh, Drapier, which we're gonna discuss later. They import, uh, let me look at my notes here. Carmel, Juness, all sorts of you know, really pretty well-known kosher wines, and also a couple of Colombian rums, which if you don't want to do a sweet wine with dessert, 
I love Colombian rum and it's pretty cool that there are kosher versions of it. So speaking of, of course, uh, getting your wine, um, there's some really great websites out there, um, jwines.com, online, kosherwine.com, and of course, kosherwine.com, which is my favorite because they have really great descriptions of, of the wine, it's very easy to navigate, et cetera, et cetera. So to get to our selections we're gonna be talking about today, uh, Starting with, uh, you know, beginning of the uh, Passover meal, perhaps you know, when folks are mingling, uh, hopefully not too many folks, uh, we're still in COVID time, but at the same time, hopefully the grandparents generation is vaccinated. And uh, we'll start off uh, talking about Laurent Perrier, the uh, great French champagne house, uh, one of the few family owned large houses still out there. It's been owned by three women over time, which I think is pretty rad. And this is a great aperitif champagne. It's crisp, fine bubbles, you know, something to, to wake up the senses. They also, excuse me, do their uh, Laurent Perrier Rosé um, kosher, which is fantastic. Um, one thing that we'll uh, find ourselves talking about in this is, you know, some of the wines are Mevishal, some of them are not. You know, you can delve into the, the subject deeply, but basically Mevishal is a process of heating the wine where it can be handled by non-Sabbath observed Jews. So uh, for instance, Laurent Perrier is not, but the Drapier, which is the next one we're gonna discuss is. Um, as uh, David Raka says in his very good breakdown of rabbinical wine laws, uh, the best time to do your heating is when it's still wine must. If you do it after the wine is made, it's definitely gonna affect the quality. And Mevachal wines don't traditionally last as long as non mevachal wines, but otherwise there's, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, you know, especially in a fresh young wine. So anyway, the Drapier Carte d'Or, the classic wine uh, was, named by Forbes as one of the three you know, great champagne houses that go underrepresented in media that you should check out. And it's gonna be a little bit yeastier. It's gonna be a little bit fuller, although still fresh. This would be a very good gefilte fish wine. Moving on to dry white wines. Uh, this is a particularly exciting wine uh, period, but it's really exciting that it's available uh, as a kosher wine for Passover. And um, by the by, Almost all kosher wines are kosher for Passover because Rosh Hashanah and Passover are the biggest selling holidays for kosher wine. So you really behoove one to make sure that your uh, rabbinical uh, supervision uh, takes care of that, that it is actually kosher for Passover because that's when, when the wines traditionally move. But to move on to some white wines, I'm super excited that this is available kosher as I mentioned. Chateau Bureau, the legendary Sautern house, produces a dry white wine, which I believe is their answer to Chateau Akem, of course, another highly esteemed house's E. Grec. But this is their G, which is a dry style white wine, of course, Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon dominated, which is gonna give you some real roundness, but of course the Sauvignon Blanc brings crispness and freshness. And that's just a, that's a fun, you know, a fun wine for your friends. You know, hopefully you're not having too many friends over, but this is the kind of thing that uh, is very engaging because it's, oh my goodness, this great Sautern you know, house also produces a dry white wine. Whoa. Um, so next wine I wanted to mention is Contessa Annalisa Gavi de Gavi. It's the first kosher Gavi de Gavi. And uh, you know, Gavi de Gavi has a mixed reputation. I personally love it. It's one of the first uh, wines of any kind that I fell in love with. And this is, you know, Cortese. It's affected by both uh, the mountains and the Mediterranean. So it's a really kind of perfect um, terroir for their Cortese grape, which is, you know, slightly thin skinned. And if it's not made well, can, you know, can over yield can be bland, but you know, a well-made Gavi de Gavi is an absolute gem. This would be a good pairing for your matzo ball soup. 
And then moving on. Oh, I love this one. The Unorthodox uh, Sauvignon Blanc. This is from Parle. Uh, one of my favorite Sauvignon Blancs I've ever had is from South Africa, Southern Right, which is not kosher. But if you like that style of South African Sauvignon Blanc where you get the crispness, but also a little bit of creaminess, you know, South Africa is a great place to find it. And Pearl is just uh, a little bit Northeast of uh, where the Southern Rite is made in Walker Bay. So a little bit less maritime influence, but still a nice, clean, crisp wine. You know, and certainly for, you know, folks who aren't fussy, this would be four cups of this and you're great. Um, and maybe, you know, throw a little food coloring in there if you want to you know, be very strict about uh, keeping to the, the spirit of the holiday. Moving on uh, to uh, some of our, well, no, we've got one more white, um, the Le Marin Marinière Chablis. Um, not a lot of uh, kosher Chablis out there, but this is going to give you, you know, some good chalkiness, some acidity, you know, and, and that, you know, that Chablis mineral character. Now moving on to red wines, we are going to talk about Borgo Reale, and we're going to be tasting this later, so I won't say too much about it, but it is the first kosher Montepulciano Abruzzo, and of course uh, Abruzzo is east of Lazio in the center of Italy, when of course Lazio is where Rome is located. All right, so then we move on to Les Demoiselles de Opera. This is uh, a fun one. Uh, surprisingly for a left bank Bordeaux, it's uh, Merlot dominated. So you're gonna get a little bit, you know, the softer tannins, the plushness, and uh, you know, very food friendly. This would be quite good with your roast chicken, um, but you could handle the brisket as well. And then uh, moving on to something that you probably, you know, will be more of a splurge, but uh, Leoville Poifre, is, you know, a second growth. Originally, uh, it was Leoville, you get what I'm saying. Um, it was, you know, it's a second growth, but uh, Leoville Poifere is, you know, considered you know, the highest quality, and this is their kosher version. And you, as you would expect on the uh, left bank, it is Cabernet dominated, and a little pricey, but, you know, the kind of wine you know, that will, uh, will wow your friends. And I also, when thinking about price points for these wines, you know, for instance, the Unorthodox Sauvignon Blanc is super reasonable. The Borgo Reale, again, is pretty reasonable. You know, it's hopefully you're having a smaller gathering, which means you can spend more per person. And then uh, finally, this is a, a total splurge. This is about $180. Uh, you'd, you'd have to be both, uh, quite well off, but maybe with the stimmy, um, the Rene Le Carrière Gevry Chambertin, another you know, kind of amazing place to find kosher wine in Burgundy. I love Gevry Chambertin, it has that wonderful muscled quality and gaminess and that only increases with age. So that maybe this is one uh, you, you put away for yourself, but it's, it's fun to know it's out there. And also uh, if you wanted to look to the Rhone, um, Van de Vienne, which is a consortium of great Rome winemakers, now makes a kosher San Josef. And San Josef is probably my favorite uh, Syrah region. I mean, obviously, Cote Roti is more prestigious, but uh, no one has Cote Roti money, you know, even if you're buying the Chevrolet Chambertin. So that brings us to dessert. And as I mentioned, Colombian rum might be a good choice. You could also do the Chateau Guiro's Petit Guiro, which I think would actually be kind of a nice choice because unlike the, you know, their Chateau Guiro, their premier crew classe, you know, main, you know, mainstay, their flagship, part of this is done in stainless steel. So it's going to be a little bit fresher and not have so much of that new oak kind of pressing down on it. So let's, I uh, always like to taste something for these segments. So let's have a look at the Borgo Reale Monte Pulciano di Bruzzo 2019. So I'm just going to pour this next to the computer and hope I don't pour it on the computer. And success. So for our nose, let's give it a little swirl. Really a lovely nose. 
and is fairly intense for Montepulciano. One interesting thing to note is uh, Montepulciano d'Abruzzo is named after the place. Um, and it's, you know, the Montepulciano grape, but there also, of course, is Montepulciano in Tuscany, completely unrelated, by the by. So let's give this another sniffy sniff. I'm getting uh, some tomato leaf, which I always get in Italian reds, stewed tomatoes, unripe fig, strawberry, definitely like an underripe green strawberry. A surprisingly good tannic structure, a nice juiciness, but also there's an earthiness to, the, to this, almost, almost dusty, almost a dusty quality. And the tannins are quite, they're, they're well knit, but they're more pronounced than I would have guessed uh, for a Montepulciano. Really, really lovely. This would be, as I mentioned, killer with roast chicken. But I think you could actually enjoy this with brisket perfectly well. And uh, this guy was about 10 bucks at Binnie's. So if you're going to go the Binnie's route, this is a really nice choice to go with. And you could certainly just have four glasses of this and uh, fulfill your holiday obligation uh, quite happily because it's delicious. In any case, uh, I think, yeah, I did. I wanted to make sure that I mentioned uh, some of the local Chicago spots that you can find kosher wine. Uh, the woman at the Jewel was extremely nice when I called her. I don't have a car, so I didn't really know what they had. Um, I've been to Hungarian recently and they have an amazing selection, but Jennifer at the Jewel, let me know that it's in the wine section. It's in aisle six and also in the special Passover section. So get shopping folks. Uh, have a wonderful Passover, uh, and it's been fun talking with y'all. Bye now.